Alright, so plant cryptids. They might seem like they don't have too much about them, but it actually surprised me how much really are out there and the fascinating stories behind them. From Alexander the Great recording accounts of him talking to a tree that predicted his future, to a tree that made people lose their sense of purpose and direction, there's a lot of weird and obscure entries here. And just before we begin, consider subscribing if you haven't already, it helps the small channel out. Anyways, with that in mind, welcome to the Plant Cryptids Iceberg. Tier 1. The Death Dealing Tree of the Philippines In the dense forest of the Mindanao region in the Philippines, an eerie and foreboding tree stands, shrouded in dark tails and surrounded by human bones. This tree, described as dark grey and towering at 35 feet with a vast diameter of 80 to 100 feet, emits a foul smell reminiscent of carrion, adding to its ominous presence. It's said that a planter from Mississippi, while exploring the area, stumbled upon this weird sight noticing a human skull under the tree's shade. His curiosity was abruptly halted by his guide's panicked warning as a branch ominously reached towards him. This chilling encounter was documented in the American Weekly on January 4th, 1925 under the title Escape from the Embrace of the Man-Eating Tree. The narrative describes an experience where the tree, initially appearing in anime, suddenly comes to life, its leaves unfurling and stretching towards the planter with a sinister intent. The leaves, armed with sharp spines oozing with the liquid, moved hypnotically, kind of like how a cobra moves. Just as one of the leaves nearly blinded the planter, a desperate escape ensued, leaving them lying outside the tree's deadly reach, while it thrashed violently, unable to ensnare its intended victims. The speculation arises that the tree's apparent animation could be attributed to an infestation of snakes, creating an illusion of a living, malevolent entity. Mandrake Mandrake is a plant that has fascinated cultures around the globe for centuries. It belongs to a Solanaceae family, alongside three species native to the Mediterranean basin and Central Asia. Its thick, often forked roots resembling human legs have earned it a reputation for magical and psychoactive properties, leading to its widespread mention in various myths, legends, and historical texts. The plant was historically celebrated for its medicinal and narcotic uses, with the ancient Greeks and Romans utilizing mandrake's roots for their sedative and anesthetic properties. Dioscorides and Pliny the Elder, for instance, documented its use in surgical procedures and for pain relief, often in the form of mandrake wine. The Arabs later developed the Spongia salminifera, a sponge soaked in a concoction that included mandrake juice, used to induce sleep during surgical operations, meaning it was basically an early form of anesthesia for them. Mandrake's connection to myths and magic is equally rich and varied though, which is where the cryptid status comes from. It was believed to scream when uprooted, a cry so potent it could kill anyone who heard it. This led to harvesting rituals involving a hungry dog to pull the plant from the earth. Despite its historical uses, the mandrake's reputation was not solely positive. It was also associated with witchcraft, fertility rites, and even as a tool for love and fortune charms. The root's human-like shape led to its use under the doctrine of signatures, where it was believed the resemblance to the human body indicated its potency in medical treatments, particularly for fertility and childbirth. Barnacle Tree The barnacle tree myth involving the barnacle goose is an interesting blend of natural observation and medieval mythology. This myth suggested that barnacle geese grew from trees or emerged from barnacles attached to driftwood rather than being hatched from eggs. This belief persisted into the Middle Ages driven by observations of goose barnacles, which is a type of crustacean attached to wood, which bore a superficial resemblance to geese because of their bulbless white shells and black stalks. The lack of observed nesting sites for the barnacle goose also contributed to the myth's credibility, as these birds breed in remote arctic regions, far from the eyes of medieval observers. Gerald of Wales, a royal clerk and chaplain in the late 12th century, was among the first to document this myth in his manuscript Topographia Hibernica noting the peculiar emergence of geese from pieces of driftwood. The myth was further elaborated over the centuries, finding its way into various literary and scholarly works, suggesting that the geese were either the fruit of trees or the product of spontaneous generation from barnacles. Notably, the myth had significant religious and dietary implications. It provided a convenient loophole for the consumption of meat during periods of fasting, as the barnacle goose was not considered flesh born from flesh, which is pretty weird and a bit confusing. This led to debates among religious figures and scholars, with some Irish clergy treating the goose as permissible food during Lent, while figures like Pope Innocent III eventually prohibited its consumption during such periods. Albertus Magnus even went a step further by breeding the geese, 
demonstrating their natural reproduction processes and thereby refuting the myth of spontaneous generation. But yeah, it was pretty big back then, which is really interesting. Jin Manju The Jin Manju, or human face tree, is a mythical creature found in both Japanese and Chinese folklore, classified as a type of yokai and yogai. It's basically depicted as a tree that bears flowers or fruits with human faces. This legendary tree has captivated the imagination through its appearances in literature, particularly in Edo period's Kunjaku Hyaki Shui by Tuyami Saiken, which is a renowned collection of yokai illustrations. The origins of Jinmanju are steeped in mystery though, with various theories about its mythological roots. In Japanese folklore, it's said to have originated from a tree in the Garden of Gods, bearing fruit that resembled the faces of young children, with a curse of eternal silence placed upon those who ate it by the God of Silence. Conversely, in Chinese folklore, the Jinmanju is known as Ren Mianachu and is said to grow in the land of the dead, bearing the faces of deceased individuals on its fruit. Despite the slight variations in these stories though, the Jinmanju's mythological origins remain a subject of intrigue. Botanically, the Jinmanju is described as a small, rare tree that can grow up to 6 meters tall, with a slender trunk, small oval-shaped leaves, and branches that spread out in various directions. The fruit is particularly notable for its sweet taste, nutritional value, and unique appearance, resembling human heads. The tree is also said to thrive in full sun to partial shade, and requires regular monitoring for pests and diseases. Culturally, the Jin Manju holds significant symbolism in both Japanese and Chinese folklore, often seen as a symbol of the interconnectedness of all living things and the impermanence of life. Alright, moving on to tier 2. The Madagascar Tree The Madagascar tree was first popularized through a narrative of carnivorous botanical marvels. Originating from a report by Edmund Spencer for the New York World on April 26, 1874, the tale captivated the public with his description of a man-eating tree encountered by so-called German explorer Carl Leisch in Madagascar. Leisch's harrowing account of witnessing a human sacrifice by the M. Kodo tribe to this ferocious plant captured the imagination of readers worldwide, further sensationalized by subsequent newspaper reports, including an 1874 article in the South Australian Register. The tree was depicted as a grotesque predator with tendrils like serpents and leaves that acted with a deadly, animate purpose in searing and consuming its victims with a chilling efficiency. The narrative detailed a sacrificial ritual where a woman was compelled to drink a liquid from the tree, only to be gruesomely strangled and absorbed by its serpentine appendages. Further intrigue was added by Chase Osborne, a former governor of Michigan, who claimed in his book Madagascar Land of the Man-Eating Tree that such tree was well known among the tribes and missionaries of Madagascar. He reiterated Leisha's account, cementing the tree's place in cryptid lore. However, this captivating story was later revealed to be a fabrication, a piece of fiction created by Spencer. In 1888, the journal Current Literature exposed the tale as a hoax, yet it remains a fascinating example of the era's fascination with the exotic and unknown, as well as the power of the press to create enduring myths. The Indian Tree of the Sun and Moon According to a legend, the oracle tree of the sun and moon possessed the unique ability to tell the future, with its two distinct parts of the trunk speaking at different times of the day. By day, it would convey messages in a male voice, and by night, it would switch to a female voice. This feature attracted notable historical figures, such as Alexander the Great and Marco Polo, who are said to have sought the tree's counsel during their travels. Located in the province of Tonakane, southeast of Persia, the tree was revered and worshipped by the local populace. They believed it to be the most famous of all oracle trees, a testament to its profound impact on the cultural and spiritual landscape of the region. Alexander the Great's encounters with the tree are a key part of his legendary expeditions. He described being led to a park where the sun and moon trees stood, guarded by priests and resembling cypress trees. These trees, he recounted, were covered in animal skins, with the male tree adorned in he-bee skins and the female in she-bee skins. The male tree was named the sun, or muthu, and the female tree the moon, or amusie. Alexander's narrative includes an evening when a voice from the sun tree spoke in the Indian tongue, predicting his demise, a prophecy that left his accompanying Indians too frightened to translate. Marco Polo also offered his account of the tree, describing it as tall, thick, and bearing a unique bark that was green on one side and white on the other. The solitary tree, producing a rough husk similar to that of a chestnut but empty inside, stood as a beacon in an immense plain worshipped by the natives for its divine connection. Fern Flower The Fern Flower is a mythical entity rooted in Baltic, Estonian, and Slavic mythologies. 
is believed to bloom for a very short time on the eve of summer solace, which is celebrated around June 21st or sometime July 7th. This magical flower is said to bring fortune to the person who finds it, and in some tales, it even grants the ability to understand animal speech. The lore surrounding the fern flower varies across cultures, with some stories suggesting that finding the flower or its seed could lead to acquiring immense riches, understanding hidden truths, or even gaining magical abilities like invisibility. In Slavic tradition, particularly during the Ivan Kupala night, the search for the fern flower is a significant event filled with mysticism and magic. This night, celebrated on July 6th to 7th or June 23rd to 24th, depending on the calendar used, is associated with various rituals of water, fertility, and purification. Despite all its presence in folklore, the fern flower is a product of legend rather than botanical reality, as ferns don't actually produce flowers. However, the myth might have been inspired by flowering plants that resemble ferns or are termed as flowering ferns due to their appearance. Tier 3 Lotus Tree The lotus tree, part of ancient Greek mythology, is famously associated with the lotus eaters encountered by Odysseus and his crew during their homeward journey in Homer's Odyssey. This mythical tree produced fruit that, when eaten, induced a state of forgetfulness and contentment, compelling those who consumed it to abandon their journey and aspirations, desiring nothing more than to remain in a state of blissful apathy. The narrative serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of temptation and the loss of one's sense of purpose and direction. The exact botanical identity of the lotus tree still remains a matter of speculation and interpretation among historians and botanists alike, with various plants being proposed as a real-life counterpart to the mythical lotus. These suggestions range from species of clover and the date plum to different types of water lilies and even the jujube tree, each possessing characteristics that could align with the effects described in the myth. Herodotus, a 5th century BC Greek historian, placed the lotus eaters along the coast of Libya, further mystifying their exact geographical location. This ambiguity has led to various interpretations over the centuries, with the story of the lotus eaters continuing to captivate the imagination as a symbol of the lure of escapism and the natural human desire for peace and forgetfulness. The term lotus eater has since entered the lexicon as a metaphor for a person who leads a life of indolence and dreamy indolence, avoiding the harsh realities of the world. The myth of the lotus tree and its eaters serves as a timeless reminder of the balance between the pursuit of pleasure and the necessity of purpose and duty in human life. Kodama Kodama are mystical spirits from Japanese folklore, deeply connected to trees, particularly ancient or sacred ones. The spirits are believed to reside in certain trees, acting as their protectors and nurturing them. This belief is so strong that there are rituals and traditions to honor Kodama, including marking trees inhabited by them with a sacred rope called Shimanawa to signify their divine presence. Cutting down a tree that houses a Kodama is thought to bring misfortune, a belief that illustrates the deep respect for nature ingrained in Japanese culture. In Japanese mythology, Kodama are not just limited to their role as tree spirits though. They are often associated with other spiritual beings and entities, like kami, nature deities that embody natural elements such as mountains, rivers, and trees. While kami represent broader aspects of nature, Kodama are specifically focused on their symbolic relationship with trees. There are also tales of Kodama interacting with other supernatural beings like oni and yokai, but Kodama are generally considered benevolent spirits. They are typically depicted as small, flying balls of light or wisps, sometimes with a humanoid figure inside. They're known to reside in the deepest parts of old forests and are rarely seen by humans. Their presence is often sensed through the sounds of the forest, like the echoing groans that are interpreted as the death of a kodama or its tree, or as a prophecy of an upcoming tragedy. The relationship between a kodama and its tree is profound. If one is hurt or dies, the other can't survive. In modern Japanese society, the reverence for kodama continues, with features in various forms of art, literature, and popular culture including in Hayao Miyazaki's film, Princess Maranoke. Hungry Grass Hungry Grass, known in Irish as Fargarta, meaning famine grass, is a concept from Irish folklore that describes a patch of cursed grass. It was said that anyone stepping on this grass would be afflicted with an insatiable hunger or weariness, sometimes to the point of death. But this phenomenon was indistinguishable from other patches of grass, making it particularly feared and mysterious. The origins of the hungry grass myth are often attributed to the psychological impact of the Great Famine in Ireland during the 1840s. It was commonly believed that stepping on the grave or burial plot of a famine victim could trigger the curse of the hungry grass. An alternative version of the hungry grass legend tells of temporary hunger striking those who walk on it and to safely cross 
one must carry food like a sandwich or crackers, along with some beer. The term hunger grass was also used to describe hunger pains, emphasizing the strong association between the curse and insatiable hunger. Hunger grass also is an eerie connection to Hungry Hill, a place where the curse is believed to originate. The legend tells of a young fisherman who defied warnings and climbed the hill. He ate an apple and sandwich while on the grass, which seemed to protect him from its effects. This angered the fairies, leading them to spread hungry grass far and wide. To counter the curse's effects, people began carrying food with them wherever they went, and others met a tragic fate because of their skepticism. Eventually, a wall was constructed around Hungry Hill, bringing an end to the curse and the famine. However, the fear remains that if the wall were to fail, hungry grass might return, once again bringing hunger and weakness to those who encounter it. Kid Chaos Kid Chaos, also known as the Golden Spruce, was a sacred tree in Haida mythology, rooted in the cultural heritage of the Haida people. The Sitka Spruce tree, located on the banks of the Yakuan River on the Haida Gwaii Archipelago in British Columbia, Canada, was unique because of a rare genetic mutation that caused its needles to be golden in color, rather than the typical green. In Haida mythology, the story of Kit Yes tells of a young boy who showed disrespect towards nature, leading to a devastating storm that destroyed his village. The only survivors were the boy and his grandfather. As they fled, the grandfather warned the boy not to look back at the destruction. The boy, however, disobeyed and was immediately transformed into a golden bruise, serving as a reminder for the Haida people to always respect nature. Tragically, in January 1997, Kid Kiyos was felled by Grant Hadwin, a former forest engineer, as an act of protest against the logging industry. His actions were met with widespread outrage and sadness. Hadwin then was arrested but mysteriously disappeared under suspicious circumstances while traveling by kayak to his trial, leaving his fate unknown. Following the tree's felling, efforts were made to preserve its legacy. Cuttings from Kid Yes were grafted onto ordinary stick of spruce, resulting in a few golden saplings. One of these saplings survives today at the University of British Columbia. Other cuttings were also propagated with the hope of one day growing a new golden spruce. The only wood harvested from the Kid Yes was used to make a part of the Six String Nation guitar, a symbol of Canadian history and culture. Tier 4 Cow Eating Tree the cow eating tree, also known in South America as the Arbo de la Morte or Tree of Death, is a cryptid legend that has been around for centuries. The mythical tree is believed to prey on cows and other large animals, luring them with sweet fruit before devouring them whole. The legend traces back to the 16th century when Spanish conquistadors were warned by indigenous people about a tree with the power to capture and consume large animals. Despite no confirmed sightings, the tale persists, especially in areas where cattle and other large animals have mysteriously gone missing. In a different account from India, specifically in Mangalore, there's a story from October 2007 about a carnivorous tree that allegedly tried to consume a whole cow. The cow, owned by Anand Gauda, was grazing in the forest when it was reportedly seized by the tree's branches. The cow herd, terrified, alerted the villagers who managed to rescue the cow by striking the tree until it released the animal. This incident led to the tree being called Billy Mara or Tiger Tree locally and the reports of cattle returning home without tails, suggesting other encounters with similar trees. Man-eating tree of Nubia The man-eating lotus of Nubia is steeped in the mystique of ancient Nubia, a region now encompassing modern-day Sudan and southern Egypt. This mythical plant is often associated with the white and blue lotuses native to Egypt, revered for their beauty and featured prominently in Egyptian art. Phil Robinson, in his 1881 book Under the Punka, first brought attention to this carnivorous plant, which he described as capable of devouring humans and animals. The mad-eating lotus, according to folklore, lured victims with this shimmering, dew-covered fruit, inducing a deep, peaceful slumber in those who consumed it. This facade of tranquility masked its true nature as a dangerous predator. The plant's description of folklore is both vivid and terrifying too. It's portrayed as having waxen flowers and grasses with sharp spikes surrounding its base. These spikes were said to immobilize prey, allowing the plant to absorb nutrients from their blood. This blood-fed foliage contributed to the plant's fearsome reputation, likening it to a charnel house storing remnants of consumed animals. This folklore has had a significant cultural influence too, finding mention in various ancient texts and poems. For instance, the tale of the lotus eaters in Homer's The Odyssey resonates with the theme of the man-eating lotus, where the consumption of lotus fruits caused forgetfulness and apathy like we talked about before. Alfred, Lord Tennyson's poem, The Lotus Eaters, further explores this theme, emphasizing the temptation to escape into oblivion. Tier 5. Naripon 
The Nari Pon, also known as Nari Fon, is a fascinating element of Buddhist mythology, particularly prominent in Thai folklore. According to these legends, the Nari Fon is a tree that bears fruit in the shape of young female creatures. These maidens are depicted as growing attached by their heads to the tree branches. The tree is believed to grow in the Himafen, a legendary forest where its fruits are harvested by celestial beings known as Gandharvas. The origin of the Narifon tree is likened to the story involving the god Indra, who created it to protect Vasantara, a Bodhisattva, which is a Buddha to be, and his family. While Vasantara's wife was in danger of being attacked by hermits or yogis, Indra created the Narifon trees to distract these men. The fruits, in the image of Indra's beautiful wife, would enchant the hermits, causing them to lose their powers after interacting with them. These mythical beings are described as having the same internal organs as humans, but no bones, and they possess magical powers, including the ability to sing and dance. The myth states that the trees would bear fruit daily after Vasantra and his family passed away, and this would continue until the teachings of Buddha are lost, predicted to be 5,000 years after his death. The fruits are said to last for 7 days before withering and dying if not picked. Interestingly, there are claims of two pods being housed in a Buddhist temple near Bangkok, said to have originated from the Himafan forest. The Narifon has also inspired Thai culture, with representations in Thai comic books and movies, and amulets and charms made in the likeness of Narifon girls being sought throughout Thailand. Brazilian Monkey Trap Tree The Monkey Trap Tree, also known as Pega Macaco in Portuguese, is a cryptid carnivorous plant that was reportedly discovered in the jungles of northeastern Brazil, near the regions bordering the Guenas. The existence of this tree was attributed to the claims of Mariano da Silva, or Canido Mariano da Silva Rondon, a well-known Brazilian military engineer and explorer. According to a report, this tree was seen by Mariano da Silva during his expedition to a district in Brazil adjacent to Guana, where he was seeking out the settlement of the Yatapu Indians. The tree, about 6 to 7 meters high and with a trunk diameter of around 90 centimeters, is said to trap animals, particularly monkeys. It exudes a sharp odor that attracts these animals. Once the monkeys climb the trunk, they are quickly enclosed by the leaves of the tree and eventually consumed, leaving only their bones which are later dropped to the ground. Lamb of Tartary The Lamb of Tartary, also known as the Vegetable Lamb or Baromets, is a creature from Central Asian folklore. It was described as a plant-animal hybrid with a lamb physically connected to a plant, often considered a form of zoophyte. This mythical being captivated the imagination of travelers, scholars, and philosophers for centuries leading to various interpretations and debates about its existence and nature. One of the earliest mentions of this creature comes from Fjar Odrek of Friuli, who traveled extensively in the 14th century. He described gourds in Persia that supposedly contained lamb-like beasts when ripe. Similarly, Sigismund von Hiberstein, a 16th century ambassador, reports detailed accounts of the Baromets near the Capsian Sea, describing it as a lamb-like creature growing from melon-like seeds. It was believed to have blood, a crab-like flesh, and hooves made of parted hair, becoming a favorite food for wolves and other animals. The Lamb of Tartary also sparked philosophical and botanical discussions during the Renaissance. For instance, Giovanni Battista della Porta, an Italian polymath, hypothesized about the therapeutic powers of plants through analogies with animals, using the vegetable lamb as an example, using the vegetable lamb as an example in his text. In the late 17th century, Engelbert Kaempfer, a German scholar and physician, attempted to locate the lamb during his embassy to Persia. While he found no physical evidence of its existence, he speculated that the legend could have originated from the practice of harvesting soft wool from unborn lambs. Molly Molly, a mythical herb from Greek mythology, is famously known for its appearance in Homer's Odyssey. According to a tale, Hermes gave this magical herb to Odysseus as a protection against the sorcery of serfs when he visited her palace to rescue his friends. The herb was described as having a black root and a flower as white as milk which was seen as a sign of its magical nature. This distinctive appearance with its contrasting colors symbolized its powerful properties. The story of Molly is deeply rooted in the mythical narrative of the Odyssey, wherein Odysseus's men, having landed on Ayaya, were transformed to swine by Circe. Molly acted as an antidote to her enchantments. The herb's properties were so potent that it was said to be dangerous for mortal men to pluck, reserved only for the gods who wield power beyond human capabilities. The exact identification of Molly has been a subject of debate and speculation though. Various interpretations and scientific guesses have been proposed regarding its real world counterpart. Some theories suggest that the Molly could be identified with plants like the Peganum harmala or the Ajaplex halimus, known for their particular characteristics that could match the description in the myth. Medical historians have also speculated that the transformation described in the Odyssey might be a metaphor 
for anticholinergic intoxication, which fits with the properties of the snowdrop flower, containing garantamine, a substance that can counteract such effects. Our right, onto the last tier, tier 6, Peridexion tree. The Peridexion tree, also known as the Perendens, is a mythical tree rooted in medieval Christian mythology and prominently featured in medieval bestiaries. This tree was believed to grow in India and is described in the Sayologist, an early Greek language Christian didactic text and compendium. According to the legend, the Peridexion tree had a sweet fruit that was particularly loved by doves. These doves would live in the tree and feed on its fruit. Interestingly, dragons, who were enemies of the doves, feared the shadow of the tree. Therefore, while doves remained within the tree or its shadow, they were safe. However, any dove that strayed away from the tree's protection would be caught and killed by the dragon. This allergical tale holds deep Christian symbolism. The tree itself represents God and the Father, and its shadow symbolizes God the Son. The fruit of the tree is likened to the wisdom of the Lord or the Holy Spirit. The doves are representative of Christians, who are safe as long as they remain faithful to the church. Conversely, leaving the church is akin to leaving the tree's protection, making one vulnerable to the dragon, symbolizing the devil. The Paradexion tree's story serves as a moral and religious allergy, emphasizing the importance of staying within the protective bounds of Christian faith to avoid the dangers represented by the dragon or the devil. This mythological concept was widely circulated in medieval Europe through bestiaries and Christian teachings, often used as a tool for illustrating the concepts of faith, protection, and the pearls of straying from religious teachings. Raskovnik The Raskovnik is a legendary herb from Slavic folklore, known across South Slavic countries under various names, reflecting the rich cultural diversity of the region. It's famed for its magical ability to unlock or uncover anything locked or closed, a trait that symbolizes liberation, insight, and the discovery of hidden treasures. Despite its widespread mention in tales and myths, identified the Raskovnik remains a challenge, with no single plant universally acknowledged as its real-world counterpart. The Raskovnik's lore is rich with accounts of its power to open iron locks, reveal hidden wealth, and even protect against evil forces. Tales often depict it as a key not only to physical locks, but to metaphysical barriers, offering insights into hidden knowledge, justice, and personal enlightenment. Its ability to uncover buried treasures speaks to a deep human desire for discovery and the uncovering of secrets. Despite these fantastical properties, the Raskovnik is also described as eternally elusive, embodying the idea that some of nature's greatest gifts are meant to be revered rather than possessed. According to legend, only certain animals such as tortoises, snakes, and hedgehogs are believed to recognize the Raskovnik and can inadvertently assist humans in obtaining it. These animals, with their supposed connection to the underworld, highlight the Raskovnik's link to the mystical and the arcane. In folklore, obtaining the Raskovnik involves intricate schemes, such as tricking a tortoise by blocking its access to its nest to force it to use the herb to breach the barrier. This method of acquisition underscores the lengths to which individuals would go to harness the herb's purported magical properties. Silphium Silphium, often referred to as laser by the Romans, was a highly esteemed plant in ancient times, known in the region of Cyrene in North Africa. It was celebrated for its medicinal properties, culinary uses, and notably as a form of birth control. This plant was so integral to the economy of Cyrene that its image was minted on the city's currency. Despite its value, Silphium was driven to extinction by the 1st century CE due to overharvesting and overgrazing, compounded by the demands of absentee landlords seeking profit from Silphium fat and sheep. Ancient sources like Pliny the Elder lamented its loss, noting that substitutes from Persia, Media, and Armenia could not match its quality. Medically, Silphium was reputed to treat a wide array of conditions, from coughs and sore throats to fevers and indigestion. It was also believed to have contraceptive and abrotificient properties, with Asian physicians like Hippocrates and Serranus documenting its uses. Culinary-wise, it was a favorite seasoning in greco roman cooking, featured in recipes by Apicius. The plant's possible connection to the heart symbol due to the shape of its seed or fruit depicted on the ancient Syrian silver coins further underscores its cultural significance. In modern times, there have been claims of Silphium's rediscovery in Turkey, where a plant bearing striking similarities to ancient descriptions of Silphium, including its medicinal properties, have been identified. This finding by a Turkish researcher suggests that Silphium, or a very close relative, might not be extinct after all. The researcher's analysis revealed that the plant contains numerous compounds with potential medicinal benefits, sparking interest in its ancient and contemporary relevance. Spaghetti Tree The Spaghetti Tree hoax, orchestrated by the BBC on April Fool's Day in 1957, stands as one of the most memorable media pranks of the 20th century. The hoax involved a three-minute segment on the Panorama program, showcasing a family in Switzerland harvesting spaghetti from trees. 
The segment was particularly convincing due to the narration by the respected broadcaster Richard Dimbleby and the unfamiliarity of Spaghetti to the British public at that time. The BBC even went so far as to advise curious viewers who inquired about growing their own spaghetti trees to place a sprig of spaghetti in a tin of tomato sauce and hope for the best. The prank capitalized on the lack of familiarity with spaghetti among the British population, where pasta was not a staple and was often encountered only in tinned form. The ruse was so effective that even BBC staff members were momentarily duped, prompting Sir A.N. Jacob, the general director of the BBC at the time, to research spaghetti to verify the authenticity of the report. The segment reported a bumper spaghetti harvest thanks to the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil and went into detail about the breeding efforts to produce strands of spaghetti of uniform length. The spaghetti tree hoax not only fooled hundreds of viewers but also demonstrated the power of media authority in shaping perceptions of reality. It's remembered not just for the immediate reaction it provoked but also for its lasting place in the annals of April Fools' pranks, often cited as one of the greatest hoaxes in history. This legendary prank underscored the gullibility of audiences and the trust placed in media outlets, leaving a legacy that is referenced and celebrated to this day. Squash Holliger Described as resembling a common squash or a fat zucchini, the squash holliger is said to grow in well-tended gardens, starting off green and then turning yellow over time. As these vegetable creatures ripen, they astonishingly develop legs and eyes, eventually gaining the ability to walk. The final phase of their maturation involves the formation of a mouth, after which they detach from their vines, using the remaining vine as a tail, and venture into the forest. While the existence is purely within the realm of folklore, the squash holliger is humorously suggested to serve a purpose by feeding on insects, thus aiding farmers and lumberjacks by controlling pest populations. This creature exemplifies the rich tradition of cryptobotany, an area of mythical exploration that combines elements of botany and cryptid lore, suggesting a whimsical intersection of natural world observations and human imagination. The squash holliger is particularly noted for its role in Yarns of the Big Woods, a collection of lumberjack stories published in 1922, embodying the creature spirit and humor of early 20th century North American folklore. The Vampire Vine The Vampire Vine, also known as the Devil's Snare, is a fascinating and mysterious plant reported to inhabit the swamps of Nicaragua. This plant has captivated imaginations with its seemingly vampiric qualities, as vividly described by a naturalist named Mr. Dunson. During his two-year study of the flora and fauna of Nicaragua, Dunson encountered this peculiar vine near Lake Nicaragua. He reported a terrifying experience where his dog was ensnared by the plant's rope-like tendrils, which were dark and emitted a foul odor. These tendrils seemed to actively wrap around and attempt to suck, leaving the dog blood-stained and its skin appearing as if blood had been drawn off. Dunstan's observations suggest that the vine possessed mouths or suckers that opened to receive food, displaying a voracious appetite for blood. He noted that raw meat thrown to the plant would be drained of blood within minutes, demonstrating its remarkable suction capability. The natives of the area were well aware of this vine and advised caution, indicating a deep-rooted fear and acknowledgement of its existence in local folklore. This account, while intriguing, leaves many questions unanswered and shrouded in mystery. The naturalist's efforts to study the vine further were hampered by its dangerous and elusive nature, ultimately leading him to abandon his research. Alright, the ends of the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. Drop some feedback in the comments if you have any, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.